ladies and uh, gentlemen. On behalf of the Tom Lantos Institute, I welcome you warmly to our um, second uh, public lecture on uh, human rights. And uh, Joshua Castellino, Professor Joshua Castellino, we are delighted that uh, you accepted our invitation back in May. Uh, and you, you reserved uh, um, the date and you kept your word. Thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, like to also thank uh, to uh, President and Director uh, John Shattuck, uh, who accommodated uh, us. Um, and on, 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 on a rather short uh, notice, and he uh, had always given us thoughtful advice when we started up this um, series. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Sejal Parma, who had uh, helped us conceptualizing the lecture series, and she's always been uh, extremely uh, supportive. Um, and before introducing Professor Joshua Castellino, I would like to say a few words about our own uh, institution. The Tom Lantos Institute is, a, uh, uh, is an independent uh, human rights and minority rights um, uh, institution. And um, uh, it focuses on uh, three issue areas, Jewish life and uh, anti-Semitism, uh, Roma rights and uh, citizenship, and uh, human and minority rights uh, in um, uh, general. Uh, we have a very strong advisory board, of which Joshua Castellino uh, is a uh, um, member. Uh, we define ourselves as an international research, education, and advocacy platform uh, that uh, aims to bridge the gap between research and policy norms and practice. And uh, in our work, uh, for the time being, we prioritize human rights and citizenship education together with the strengthening of democratic values. And we see this public lecture series as a step in the development of our human rights and citizenship education um, program. Uh, and we aim to demonstrate through this uh, series of, of lectures how human rights values, principles, norms, and uh, standards are um, relevant and applicable to contemporary uh, challenges. And um, we indeed um, try to highlight the problem-solving capacity of uh, human rights to individual, group, and societal um, problems. It is, of course, not by accident that uh, we invited Professor Joshua uh, Castellino uh, as a, a lecturer. Uh, for us, Joshua uh, Castellino embodies uh, a real norm entrepreneur uh, since he's deeply involved in both norm creation and norm adherence. As a, a globally known academic and uh, uh, researcher, um, he is uh, engaged in information politics, very important for advocates, but uh, also he's been involved uh, in um, uh, institution building and platform uh, building. He set up minority rights schools back in Galway in Ireland, and also he's building up uh, his law department uh, in, um, at the University of Middlesex in um, uh, London. And I have to look at my paper if I want to list some of the important, um, uh, some important points of, of, of your work, uh, uh, Joshua. Um, where is it? You are Joshua, Professor of Law and Dean of the School of Law at Middlesex University, London, and also Adjunct Professor of Law at the Irish Centre for Human Rights in Galway, Ireland. Uh, Joshua has authored seven books in international law and human rights law on self-determination, title to territory, and indigenous people's rights, 
besides over 50 academic articles on a range of these and other legal subtopics. He has completed the third in a five book series published by Oxford University Press on issues concerning global minority rights law. And uh, Joshua also founded an annual summer school on minorities, first held in 2001 in Galway Island, and it has been continued uh, in um, London. And um, Joshua also engages regularly with multilateral organizations, law societies, the judiciary and NGOs in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America on issues of human rights advocacy and public international law. Uh, Joshua sits on the leadership council of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, that's a long uh, name, which is convened by Jeffrey Sachs under the auspices of the UN Secretary General, where he co-chairs the working group entitled Gender, Social Exclusion and Vulnerable um, Groups. Uh, I'm sure, Joshua, you will make reference to some uh, uh, of your work in um, your uh, presentation of around 40 minutes, which will be followed by a question and answer session. Please. Um, thank you very much, Anna Maria. Uh, these kinds of introductions are always kind of set you up to fail because they tell you about all the things you did well before and that you aren't going to do in 40 minutes very quickly. It is a real honor to be here, and thank you very much to the Tom Lantosh Institute and Anna Maria for, for inviting me here, and to, to Mate and Louisa, who have worked very hard to put this event together. Uh, the Tom Lantosh Institute, I know, is brand new, but already I'm hearing very, very good reports of the work that you're doing, and I think the, the successful conference you held uh, in September is testament to the energy that uh, Anna Maria brings as leader of this particular organization. Uh, my topic today is, is titled, and you have a, a sheet there, really as a guide to what I'm hoping to, to speak to you about. Uh, it's titled Minorities and Poverty, a Global Snapshot of Socially Inclusive Development Policies. And I've picked this really for a number of different reasons. Um, I've picked it first of all because when you look at the world as we see it today, one of the things that you notice very clearly is a divide between the haves and the have-nots. And actually that is as much a relevant divide especially when you factor in minorities. So I want to speak to you from that particular perspective. I also speak to you as a lawyer, um, and the reason I say that, it's, say that and the reason it's relevant is that in the human rights world, we have placed an inordinate amount of emphasis on legal basis for, for gaining rights. So advocacy tends to be in courts of law. Uh, we tend to focus on litigation. We tend to focus on legislation. But when you look at it from the perspective of minorities, the big problem is lack of access. And that's quite important, and you'll, you'll get quite a lot of critique from me on the use of law in this particular field. Essentially, I think, that just to, to set this up, when you, when you um, look at the question of minorities, and especially in a country like Hungary, which I've often thought of as the home of, of minority rights for so many reasons, in the, the, the problematic history, but also the conception of national minorities, there was this concept that developed that we needed to have a mechanism to protect the few from the tyranny of the many, as it was often put in the literature. So the idea was that even if you managed to have a democracy, you always ran the risk that the democracy, by consent, would choose to violate the rights of the minority. And that is a fundamental question, especially when the world system seems to have been convinced that democracy is the answer. The problem even with democracy is democracy as a game of numbers will not solve minority questions. It's only democracy as a game of values that's likely to do that. So I want to pitch, pitch this to you in several different ways. For those of you who are minority rights experts, you will bear with me while I take people through some very basic steps on, on these issues. For those of you who haven't got any insight into minority issues, please don't hesitate to stop and ask me questions at any stage. It won't interrupt my flow in any way, I can assure you. Uh, okay, so the legacy and rationale then for the protection of minorities, and I've given you four elements there under point one, starting with an attempt to give a very, and I mean a very brief history of minority protection. When you look at the literature on this subject, what you are often told is that minority rights is actually one of the axes along which international law itself developed. 
So you can go all the way back to 1250 and the promise of Saint Louis of France to the Maronites to establish the first time there was an international document protecting minorities. And again, the rationale behind that was simple. If you have a group that's in a vulnerable position, what guarantees can you give them of their survival? And these notions were written very large in European experiences and Central European experiences of minority rights questions. You had, of course, in the League of Nations period, jumping a few 400 years, as you can always do in these kinds of lectures, you, you had in the League of Nations period the first real attempt to create structured mechanisms to protect minorities. And that system worked to a certain extent. And you have much writing in Hungarian that is really leading on the subject of the, the interwar protection mechanisms set up during the Versailles Treaty era. The fact that that mechanism failed goes without saying, because that mechanism was completely useless in the face of the genocide and the war crimes perpetrated during World War II against Jews, against Roma, and several other groups. So you have a mechanism that's set up that creates quite strong legal protection, and that mechanism fails in, in the context of an unfolding genocide. So what happens then in 1945? The UN is set up in San Francisco. The UN Charter is passed. It emphasizes the notion of the maintenance of international peace and security, the most often, often used phrase in the United Nations Charter, but it doesn't really make any mention of minorities. And that's surprising to one extent, because you think at the end of World War II, with all the events perpetrated there, the protection of minorities would be uppermost in the minds of the drafters of the Charter. Not so. The argument grows from the UN Charter that actually what we need here are human rights. So the argument is, well, if you have human rights, you gain those rights by virtue of being human, and then you need to put in place mechanisms that will protect your inherent dignity and worth. And so the whole process of human rights gets going. Now, in, the question, in these questions of setting up a human rights system, there isn't a specific emphasis on minorities, even though there's a subcommission for the protection and promotion of minorities that's in the UN system, there isn't really a document that protects minorities. In, in addition to this, when you think about the time context, you have decolonization taking place. So the UN Charter passed by 51 states. Now we have 194 states. Well, where did these states come out of? The vast majority of them came out of decolonization. In the context of decolonization, these questions of identity were submerged because the only important aspect in decolonization was the maintenance of order. So we didn't just really worry about the fact that Nigeria was a country that maybe had at least three major ethnic groups and many different visions. What mattered were the boundaries drawn for Nigeria when Nigeria was a colony, the Oil River State in Britain. We didn't so much, we didn't so much worry about the et ethnic and linguistic fault lines that existed. There's a very famous quote in 1890 in the, the British House of um, Lords, and I'm sad enough to be able to quote it to you. Uh, that, that's, by the way, the virtue of the Indian education system and memory tests. But um, essentially, Lord Salisbury stands up in 1890, and he says to his, his brethren, as they then were, in the House of Lords, he says, we, the white men, have been drawing lines on maps where no white foot has ever trod. We have been giving away mountains, rivers, and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment of not knowing where these were. So essentially, when you look at the scramble for Africa, 1884 onwards, it was simple. You basically had European armies that were meeting while the British went from Cape to Cairo, Cape Town in the south, Cairo in, in Egypt. While the French went across the Congo, guess what happened? European armies met in Africa. So they decided to meet in, at the Berlin West Africa Conference, where there wasn't a West African in sight, I should add, and they decided in a deal that you get at supermarkets, where you essentially buy one and get one free. So the, the deal at the Berlin West Africa Conference was simple. Let's agree who owns the coast, and then let's use a pencil and a ruler to demarcate territory in the African continent. Now, that was 1884, roughly 1884 to 1920. Decolonization in the UN era, 1945 onwards, essentially takes place respecting the fact that the boundaries and heritage are sacrosanct. What does that do to communities within? What does that do to indigenous peoples? What does that do to antagonistic tribes? Well, what they are told is you now have a nation. It is called Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, 
India, whichever country you want to name, that's post-colonial. That country then, and those of you who are sociologists might know Karl Deutsch, the social anthropologist, who wrote about the concept of nation building. These new entities were then told, you need to develop your nation. You need to foist your national identity. What do they base it on? Well, they base it on the majority, because that makes logical sense. So to be Indonesian, it didn't matter if you were Javanese or Achenese or from Ambon. It didn't matter if you were Muslim or Christian. Essentially, to be Indonesian, you followed the majority population. You had to speak Bahasa Indonesia, and you had to be Muslim. And that's how you, co that's how you, you delineated the coordinates of your identity. So the average post-colonial state is about 50 years old. And the average post-colonial state has many tensions. And I can speak to you about this in question and answers if you want to, with regards to the impact and how I see the Arab Spring unfolding. Because for me, that's also decolonization taking place. Two minorities then. How do we define minorities in the context of this? We have a, a definition that Francesco Capatorti wrote in 1977 that's extremely problematic, but is still something of a benchmark for minorities. And Capatorti basically says that a minority is a group numerically inferior to the rest of the population of a state who are in a non-dominant position, whose members possess ethnic, linguistic, or national, ethnic, linguistic, or religious characteristics that differ from the majority. And he goes on to add that they should have an implicit sense of solidarity towards protecting their identity. So Capatorti's definition you have on one hand in 1977, the UN system not really recognizing and emphasizing minorities, another little trend there. And the third trend is a number of post-colonial states that feel extremely insecure about their identity and how it is that they are going to make antagonistic tribes, religions, linguistic groups fit into one national identity. So these are all the themes that have been set up. The result of it for me, and this is where I talk about global snapshots if you're, if you're following my sheet, at all, the result is basically tensions that exist in many post-colonial states. In the context of the Arab Middle East, I would argue that the decolonization process never really took place. You went from colonial rule to rule by proxy. And now you're having voices coming to the fore, and this is where all the sectarianism and all the issues are, are, are bubbling through as well. So but the Arab Middle East, we know about. You could argue that what's happening there is a quest for various identity groups to assert themselves, that's often the narrative given to you, or, and this is the, the, the view I subscribe to, this is a simple quest for the rule of law and the removal of privileges from a very small group. Because that's what it is. The, the vegetable vendor in Tunisia who set himself on fire didn't really care about identity questions. He cared about the fact that there were people in his state who were gaining everything there was in the state while the vast masses were left with nothing. And that's what you hear and that's what you heard in Tahrir Square as well in the context of the, the protests against Mubarak. Now, against all of this backdrop, backdrop, you have the growth of international human rights law. Starts off in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, makes these promises, and the promises again are that the world system will uphold the inheritance and dignity and worth of every individual. That was a declaration. To lawyers in the room, that was non-binding. That was a, a statement of intent. What happened then was the process of trying to turn that aspiration into a set of legally binding norms. And that process at international level took place through a series of treaties. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, one on economic, social, and cultural rights, one on torture, one on women's rights, one on children's rights, racial discrimination, and so on and so forth. All of these are essentially standards that have been negotiated at international level that are meant to be upheld in domestic law by states. What does the UN do with regards to monitoring it? Well, they have this process where they treat states with a great deal of respect, too much if you ask me, with a great deal of respect. They treat them as high plenipotentiaries. They engage with them. But when they fail to upkeep the promises there, there isn't really any mechanism. There's no bite. So I've put down, I'll speak about this a little bit later as soft law with no teeth. But Human rights itself have grown quite significantly at the United Nations. Human rights has also become received rhetoric across the world. I remember in 2003, working in Ireland, uh, working with human rights groups, working with the Arab Lawyers Union, talking about women's rights in the Middle East, working with a whole range of other actors. And then I remember listening to the news and hearing that Bush and Blair were going to Iraq in the name of human rights. 
And I thought, well, if they are human rights activists, what am I? Because how is it then that human rights has become such easy rhetoric that you can actually use it to illegally invade a sovereign country? And believe me, I'm no fan of Saddam Hussein, never was. But the fact of the matter is that human rights became such easy rhetoric, it was mainstream to such an extent that it seemed to have lost its relevance in many ways. At the UN system, you have these two types of mechanisms. You have charter-based mechanisms and treaty-based mechanisms. The treaty-based mechanisms I mentioned before, civil and political rights, economic, social rights, and so on and so forth. The UN also works through charter-based organizations, through special rapporteurs. In fact, the special rapporteur on minority rights is Rita Itzak, who's, who's Hungarian. Uh, and again, some of you may know her very well. So it also works through these kinds of offices that are focused on highlighting the issues that exist with minorities. But by and large, it has it is been quite a glorified talking shop. It has also sucked in quite a lot of good talent to work at international level in a norm creation process when the real issue is not norm creation but implementation of norms. And that, for me, is one of the big difficulties. So there are plenty of difficulties in accessing human rights. And I'm on point three now of my, of my uh, sheet, for those of you who are following it. Essentially, that's what you have. The international human rights mechanism is a series of soft law mechanisms with limited teeth. So you could say, well, you know, the international human rights system and the treaties are, are a law. They're binding upon states. And you'll be right in saying that. The difficulty is the consequences of the failure to uphold those particular promises. What is the value that can be attached to it? And the answer is not a lot. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more in, in, a, in a while about naming and shaming. But essentially what you have is a move by which it's HRSPR. It's human rights as public relations. You need to have a box on a form that you need to be able to tick with a great deal of conviction to be able to say that your society upholds human rights. The real test of the matter for me has always been, you find a vulnerable group in any society and you test the extent to which they can access your human rights. If that vulnerable group can access your human rights, you have a human rights system. If that vulnerable group is excluded, doesn't have interlocutors, doesn't have politicians, doesn't have advocacy groups, has minimal educational standards, doesn't have the money, you are in a position where what you've created in the name of human rights is a club of entitlements for those who already have. And human rights was never meant to be that. Human rights was really meant to be about protecting the inherent dignity and worth of all, especially the vulnerable. What you actually have are human rights as a club that exists for some that can easily be accessed by them. And the real people, the real victims, can't often access the mechanisms created because of the way in which the mechanisms have been created. And that's what I want to really focus on in the, in the, the main part of, of what I want to say to you. So essentially, what we have had at the international system is naming and shaming as a tool. The argument is, you know, if you imagine we are all states here, and we all have a common interest, and we agree a standard, and we say, look, when we go home, we promise to uphold these standards. And then I go home and don't uphold the standards. The idea is next time we meet, you'll say to me, you know, you really should uphold those standards. And I'll say, yeah, you know, that's true, I should. But you know what to do. It was something happened and there's an excuse why I didn't. Or, as is more often the case, I will simply deny it. And you'll tell me you should uphold the standards. And, you'll say, and I'll say, yeah, of course I should. And I did. And that's very often the discussion we have at the international level with naming and shaming. Because essentially, a lot of states are simply shameless. It doesn't really bother them that you think they are human rights abusers. So the idea that somehow states will go and be tremendously embarrassed by their human rights performance enough to change their behavior is a myth that's not based in reality. You do have states like that. I mean, Japan, notably, has changed its behavior with regards to some of the Korean minorities after a, a UN body pointed out that they were discriminating. But by and large, Japan is not the norm of a state. Japan is very much the exception. The vast majority of states don't really want to hear about naming and shaming and are pretty shameless. So why then have human rights standards failed minorities? And I've given you, given you four, three reasons there. Um, first of all, we are unclear in the human rights world as to what it is we are trying to protect. Are we trying to protect civil and political rights? Or are we trying to promote identity-based rights? Are we trying to promote socioeconomic rights? There's this divide. In 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was passed, it st stated very clearly that human rights are indivisible, 
and consist of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. The idea that was supposed to drive the process was one legally binding standard to emerge. But that didn't happen. Essentially, the indivisible rights got divided pretty much straight away. So you had one set of states who were very keen on civil and political rights, and you had another set of states who were very keen on economic, social, and cultural rights. Much of this, by the way, based on laissez-faire Western-oriented legal systems, on which I'll say a little bit later on in the talk. You basically have a mechanism by which you have a series of rights that are civil and political oriented. The right to life, uh, right to uh, freedom of speech, right against hate speech. Many of these are rights that exist that are civil and political in nature. Against this, you have socioeconomic rights, right to education, right to food, right to sanitation, water, all of these rights. So the question became, now if I say to you, if I'm a state that has the death penalty, and there's an article in the, in the covenant that says, you shall abolish the death penalty, well, abolishing the death penalty is not going to cost me a whole lot. It is going to cost me finan financial terms, but it's not going to cost me as much as if I said to you, you have a right to food, and I have to feed you. Or if I said to you, you have the right to work, and I have to provide for you. And what this did was it opened up an age-old question about the role of law in society. And the argument goes, it's the politicians who set the agenda, it's the judiciary who essentially uphold that. It's not for the judges to make law. If the politicians want to make law, guaranteeing that nobody shall go hungry, they can. But generally speaking, politicians are averse to doing that, especially at times of austerity, as you may imagine. So the large, the, the vast thrust of human rights law has really focused on protection-oriented rights rather than pr promotion, or, uh, promotion or, or provision-oriented rights. I remember in Ireland having a, a fierce debate with the then Minister of Justice who said very, very firmly, socioeconomic rights are non-justiciable. To those of you not from the legal world, that basically means it's not for a court of law to decide on socioeconomic rights. And I remember in a debate saying to him, but to say that socioeconomic rights are non-justiciable is pure ignorance. And there was silence, because you don't tell ministers usually that they're ignorant. But the argument is simple. You can tell a man in Sudan that you don't want to send him to the moon. It's justifiable. You know, why should you send a man in Sudan to the moon? But what you can't tell a man in Sudan is that nobody has ever been to the moon, because that statement is factually incorrect. So the fact is that many societies have made socioeconomic rights justiciable. The famous cases in South Africa around HIV treatment, the famous cases around the right to food, a, a, a notable case in India, which is still feeding 220 million people at every single day. These are landmark judgments passed by Supreme Courts that essentially highlight that socioeconomic rights are here to stay and are fundamental. And that's what I want to focus on in a, in a minute. I just want to make two other points, really, with regards to why human rights mechanisms have failed. We've emphasized in our systems that the protection that's available will be available more to individuals and not to groups. So all of the rights that we have are premised as individual rights. But that doesn't really help minorities very much, because minorities can be picked off as individuals, and they have no strength, and they have no access. And most of the discrimination you see against minorities is actually systemic. How do you tackle systemic discrimination by taking individual cases? It's, it's almost impossible to gain much. So the typical scenario is you take 500 cases, and you win five. Well, that's not really going to change society. What it does for the five victims, of course, is it gives them compensation. But it doesn't really do enough in terms of societal change, nor does it succeed in putting issues on the social policy agenda. The other question, and I alluded to this at the start, if you have a system that overtly emphasizes the legal route, you need interlocutors. You need people from that community who are going to be the lawyers, the advocates. You need sympathetic voices in the police who will file the cases who will conduct the investigation. You then need a fair judicial system that is drawn from across the population who will be able to understand the plight of, of minorities and discrimination. You have uh, hardly any country in the world that has all three. If you have advocates who are very good, you tend to have police who are not focused or not derived from minority populations. If you have advocates and police from minority communities, you tend to have a judiciary who derives from a very elite elite institution. So you have this mechanism that you're hoping will solve the problem of discrimination, but it's flawed at every single stage. So 
I want to move now to, to really the, the issue on socially inclusive development policies. Essentially, for me, when you look at this issue, look at the human rights world and how it's worked in terms of protection, minor, protecting of minorities, in the last 60 years, the victories are few and far between, hopefully for reasons that I've made clear to you. I think what we need are what I'm calling their new solutions for a brave world, some principles and practice. I want to focus first on the principles and then a little bit on to giving you this global snapshot of what societies are doing. Essentially, even though we have decolonization that took place commencing in the 1940s and all the way, you could argue, to South Sudan a few years ago, actually what you have is that law in developing countries is still derived heavily from Western legal mechanisms. If you want to understand the legal system in Nigeria, and you know the legal system in Britain, that's half the battle done, because it's very similar. Similar with India, similarly with Pakistan, similarly with Indonesia, with the Dutch. You find, by and large, that the legal systems in post-colonial countries emphasize the colonial system that existed before. Sometimes, it even uses the same terminology. I remember coming across an act in India, which was called the Habitual Offenders Act, and I thought, what is a Habitual Offenders Act? I mean, how do you know an offender is habitual? How do you know that they have a habit of offending? And I thought, oh, maybe it's people who are in prison four or five times. Well, no, that's not the case. The Habitual Offenders Act was designed by the British to talk about a particular tribe, an indigenous people's tribe, who they thought were thieves and robbers. So you have a Habitual Offenders Act that's passed during colonial times, but guess what? The Indian government continues it. It still exists. The Habitual Offenders Act is still there. So the legacies we derived from colonial rule sometimes are still existent in reality, but the principles in any case still exist. So domestic systems across the world in post-colonial states still derive on individual rights, still have a constitution that doesn't really resemble very many societies, and still has a mechanism that resembles the, colonial, uh, the, the, the one that they emphasized before. The difficulty with this, you'd hopefully be able to draw the conclusion yourself, is that if you are trying to solve a problem in Nigeria between the Ogoni and the, the Igbo, well, you're not going to get a lot of answers from studying British law. Because you know what? That doesn't exist. That problem doesn't exist in the same way. There was no imposition of a state. There was no drawing of a boundary. There was no long periods of, of antagonism. There was no pretense of being one state. So how are you going to find any solution to that particular problem if you're basing your system on British law? Similarly with India, similarly with every other post-colonial state. In addition, the legal system and the way the judges have practiced the law, they usually refer to judgments in Britain, United States of America, Australia. Well, that's not very good if you're in Malaysia or Singapore. That's not going to give you answers on how to treat the Orang Asli. So the, even the way in which the judiciary have thought has been very much from south or east, if you like, to north. Decolonizing law is the center of this. Because the fact of the matter is, when you look at these societies, they have been active in trying to delineate identity questions. They don't need anymore the imposition of these particular values, because these values don't make sense. We need to move towards indigenous values. And I mean that in the problematic national context that exists. And states have begun to do this. They have begun to look to each other. So you're seeing an increasing number of judges relying on decisions from Malaysia and India and South Africa and Singapore. And that's happening for the first time in, in, in the last, well, in the last 60 years. So decolonizing law is quite central to this. Remember, and that's my point B, the courtroom is barred. And what I mean by that, it's a play on words. That in, the, in the common law countries, you talk about being called to the bar. That's when you have arrived, when you've arrived in a courtroom. Because there's actually a bar there. And the bar there, and I don't mean a place where you can buy alcohol, a bar, quite physically, is a bar. And that's also a statement that beyond this point, you will speak the language of the court. You will speak the language of power. You will find your argument, and you will tailor it to our system so our judges can understand you. It's not meant to be inclusive. But it's, it actually is very inclusive if you're from the elite institutions. It's very inclusive if you're from the elite societies. It's not so inclusive if you're from anywhere else. So the courtroom in many ways has been barred for many of those reasons. The courtroom is also barred because accessing the courtroom means you need to have the wherewithal, cash, 
You need to have the influence. You need to be able to draw on people who you trust, which is quite difficult sometimes against these, in these in ethnic contexts. You need to be able to trust those people to take your case for you, often in a language that you don't understand. So the courtroom as a site of contestation of minority rights has given us very little in the 50 or 60 years that we, we've been operating and, and tracking this, these kinds of issues. My third point, and I think this is a, the principle that gets to the heart of, of my critique of, of uh, human rights in general, poverty is the biggest factor impen, impeding rights. If you look at this, if you look at states across the board, and you look at the socioeconomic position that exists, you will find a correlation between those at the bottom of that hierarchy and the fact that they are ethnic, linguistic, minority groups, indigenous peoples. So what you've actually got is a vast number of people who are massed on the bottom of socioeconomic scales who also happen to have something in common, and that's that they are minorities. If you don't tackle poverty, you're not going to tackle any other rights that minorities have. So poverty becomes almost a marquee goal. If you can get, if you can get these people out of poverty, what you begin to have is some chance that they might be able to access some of the other rights that you're talking about. If you don't focus on that, you simply perpetrate, you simply perpetrate the inequalities into the future. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll come back to that and feel free to challenge me on that as well. Not everyone accepts that. If you look at the work of Paul Collier, and it's one of the, one of the, the references I've got there at the bottom uh, on the sheet. If you look at Paul Collier, an economist, long-standing economist who works on these issues, he, will, he writes this, this, this book, this very provocative book called The Bottom Billion. When he wrote it in 2007, there were six billion people in the world. There are now seven billion, so we've moved very rapidly of, on that seventh billion, with implications for minorities, by the way. But in the context of Collier's hypothesis, what he says is that five of the world's six billion people either live in or aspire to first world 21st century conditions. That doesn't mean they all live in the first world. It doesn't mean that they all can even, uh, even have first world conditions. But it does mean that they understand what a first world 21st century existence is. They may not all possess an iPhone, but they would probably want one for their children. They understand the concept. So five of the world's six billion, and the reason the number is so high is because of India and China, of course, who have gradually moved from the ha have-nots to the haves, and Brazil and Russia, big countries, which are giving you huge amounts of population. But that's not the emphasis of what Collier is saying. The emphasis lies on what he's calling the bottom billion. And he says to you, the bottom billion live in 14th century feudalistic conditions. They have no stake in your society. Now, I disagree with Collier's, Collier's hypothesis to the extent that the bottom billion aren't in sub-Saharan Africa and Cambodia and Laos and everywhere. The bottom billion is at home, and they are in the minorities, and they are, in, they, are, they are represented by indigenous peoples and a whole slew of other excluded communities, by the Roma, by various other populations who don't have access to, to rights. So poverty is that big element there that has to be tackled. And the fourth, the fourth principle really is that these problems are solvable. You often get this scenario by which you have people who tell you how terrible the world is and how it's impossible to solve it. Actually, it is possible to solve it, and we know that because a number of countries are actively trying to solve it. And just in the last five, seven minutes that I have, I want to give you some ideas of practice. And I've given you, I've put down eight um, elements there. I, I can't do much more than just touch on these, but I'll, I, can, I can come back to it in questions that you might have. Guaranteeing legal identity is a starting point. Because actually, for minorities across the world, the fact is that they're not registered. And as a failure to register, they don't have any legal personality. If they have no legal personality, the administrative system doesn't recognize them, and nothing flows for them. They have no access to health. They have no access to education. As far as the state is concerned, they don't exist. Cambodia has taken that problem very seriously. It is really a fairly simple problem to solve. You need to be present with registration processes where babies are born. If babies are born at home in villages, you need to make sure that your unit for registration is mobile enough. So Cambodia have demonstrated that this is possible. Now, you might say it's a really small country. That's, you know, how do you apply that elsewhere? But Cambodia is really mountainous. It's really isolated communities, and they have managed to do it. So guaranteeing legal identity isn't that difficult. We don't need to have a world in the 21st century where a baby is born who is not registered. 
And this might seem trivial to us sitting in Europe, but actually a major issue is the fact that communities, large tracts of individuals born in various places aren't registered. That means from the time they are born, their chances of getting anything from the state are minimal. If we believe that the state ought to be the provider of rights and remedies and protection, the failure to register them is the first crime. So fixing that is important. Eradicating gender-based violence. I mean, gender-based violence is, is central in many ways and occurs in majority and minority communities. But fixing gender-based violence is one of the most useful tools you can have in perpetuating a human rights-oriented principle because that really tackles. It tackles received wisdom. It tackles traditional systems. It tackles ingrained mindsets. And I think both Brazil and South Africa have mechanisms. The South African Tutuduela centers are a one-stop shop by which you can go and tackle gender-based violence. And again, I can speak to you more about that in detail if, if you're interested. I also have a reference there to the, the, first, um, the first report there under the further reading gives you quite a lot of detail on all of these systems that I'm referring to. Equitable land ownership practices. Again, minorities are excluded even though they may live in excluded and isolated communities they don't own the land they work on. So at any time, anybody might turn up and claim it, as happened in the context of Peru, in the indigenous peoples in Peru, in the Amazon basin. You have Total, the oil company, turn up one fine day and say, oh, we're here to excavate. And the indigenous people say, but who are you and what are you doing here? And they say, well, we've got an agreement signed with Lima that says we have a right to be here. And this is the problem. Indigenous peoples there were not stakeholders. They were just objects and not subjects of law. And that's an important difference. This is an object. It doesn't have rights. I can throw it to the ground. It's probably not advisable. I can throw it to the ground, and it'll be my fault. I'm not, I'm not offending the phone in any way. But a person is a subject. The difficulty with indigenous people's rights is that they have been treated as objects and not subjects of law. So in many ways, an indigenous tribe, an indigenous community, is not different from a group of trees or a river or a mountain. And that is a fundamental problem. If you treat people as, sub, as objects of law, you don't give them rights. Land ownership tends to be one of those things where indigenous peoples and minorities live on the land since time immemorial, but don't own it. Why? Because sometimes they didn't register the land. They didn't build neat little picket fences around it. They didn't get somebody who's a friend of theirs in the capital to guard a piece of, prop, a piece of paper which says title deed to land. And so their land rights tend to be violated. And again, you have practices in, in Ethiopia and Uganda. Ethiopia recently dealt with 20 million hectares. And I know we have Ethiopians, maybe you can, you can speak about that as well. These are issues that are, get to the heart of the exclusion of minorities. These are the kinds of issues that a, 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 um, a government that is genuinely interested in promoting the rights of all should look at much more carefully. Access to work and collective bargaining. I and mean, Mexico has an Oportunidades scheme which is again set up really to create a very strong identity among workers. India has various schemes as well, rural, rural employment schemes. These rural employment schemes are important because they provide a service, they generate employment, they generate cash flow, and they make these communities integrated into the mainstream economy. Again, Bolivia as well, and I don't, I'm not gonna have time to go into uh, specific examples, but I'm happy to answer, answer questions you might have. Access to public services. Health, education, very, very basic rights. Again, a vast number of minorities, when you look across the world, don't have access to basic public services. So they end up living in subsistence conditions. And this creates the classic poverty trap that Jeffrey Sachs talks about. And again, Jeffrey Sachs is on, your, on the list down there as well, talking about ending poverty. And Sachs basically says, look, it's simple. Many communities live subsistence lifestyles, which means they essentially earn just about enough to survive that particular day, week, month. Then something terrible happens. A child falls ill, the, rain, the rains fail, the setsi fly wreaks havoc, malaria runs through, and they have to borrow. And they, what happens immediately is they get into incessant debt. And that debt acts as a spiral. And he says, well, there are ways in which you can, you can solve this. You can create social protection mechanisms that don't cost the state very much, but can actually gain quite a lot of traction in terms of trying to empower communities. And again, countries have tried it. Zambia is doing this. Paraguay has a social transfer scheme. India has a rural, has a, a, a national rationing system which gives people guaranteed bits of food that they can access through the public distribution system. 
access to justice. Again, if you're saying that the interlocutors don't exist, empowering paralegals to do administrative work can play an important role. And that doesn't mean that the, the paralegals are going to be taking grand cases to Supreme Courts or anything like that. Sometimes paralegals can just help you work the administrative system and get you what you're entitled to. Human Rights Law Network, if you haven't heard of it in India, look it up, Google it, saying Google knows the answer to most things. Uh, HRLN, Human Rights Law Network, they're the ones who won the right to food case. They run an operation where paralegals essentially work with communities, not to take cases necessarily, but just to negotiate the complicated bureaucracy that exists around accessing very basic rights. These are paralegals not because they work with the law, they're paralegals because they can read and write unlike the communities that they work with. And they can play an important role as well. And TMAP for Justice in Sierra Leone, a very good example of a paralegal organization that does precisely that. Political participation. If you are going to get sustained change, you're going to have to change the way in which politics is done. Politics is meant to be a mass participation game, but politics is anything but a mass participation game. If you want to look at a really good example, of how one organization changed the elections in Senegal, look at Femme Africa Solidarité, a fabulous organization that mobilized women to speak about a range of different issues over exclusion. And again, this is the kind of activities that individuals and communities have, have undertaken that have made a major difference to national policies. Uh, again, Rwanda, India have quotas. There are very many controversies around how effective they are, but at least it puts these issues on the map which doesn't, where it doesn't exist for many other societies. And empowering the poor. And I put China there also to be provocative. Because essentially, you have this image of China as the great bad evil for human rights. And for me, it, it always amazed me as, as an Indian to see China's reputation. And of course, I bought into it too. You know, China is the, the violator of human rights. But when I looked at these two countries, very, very similar, India and China, in terms of population mix, you actually find that China is ahead on some issues and India is ahead on some issues. This idea that a democracy is somehow the panacea to solve all ills. Well, the Indian democracy is creating 70 million more people into poverty every year. 70 million more people slip into poverty each year. Guess what China has done in the last decade? 320 million people out of poverty. Now, you might quibble. You might say, oh, maybe the figures are wrong. You might say it's not 320, it's 250. You might say it's, it's, it's 12 million. The fact of the matter is there's something happening there in terms of poverty eradication schemes. In India, what you have is 8 to 10% growth rates that are benefiting 250 million people. And you might say, well, that's great, isn't it? Well, it is, except for the fact that there are a billion people in India. And the 250 million are the emerging middle class. They are the ones who are experiencing the 8% growth rate. But for them to really continue to do that, they need to build massive highways across, across India, linking the metro cities these massive highways are going to come on land that indigenous peoples are losing. They're going to connect trade, but the indigenous peoples and the vulnerable communities who are there are actually quite physically in the way of progress. So how do you track those kinds of issues? Focusing on empowering the poor as a policy imperative is fundamental. So that's what I wanted to say to you essentially. I mean, just to emphasize again that the central, the central premise here is that if you really care about ensuring that your society has human rights. You need to test how effective those human rights are and how realistic they are for the most vulnerable group in your society. And that might be an ethnic group, that might be a religious group, that might be a linguistic group, that might be women, that might be children, that might be people with disabilities, it could be anyone. You need to check the extent to which that group can access your system. If that group cannot access your system because of structural reasons, you are failing the human rights agenda and you're letting down the promise from 1948 of a world where the human rights and inherent dignity, of, uh, inherent dignity and worth of all will be protected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joshua for a brilliant uh, um, presentation. Now, provocative you have been. So uh, now there is a question and answer session coming. And uh, please uh, raise your hands. And uh, I think, uh, will you answer questions, question by sure, question? Sure. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. The one most general question about to which direction the protection of national minorities has to go. Whether we, we have to pick up the example of Swiss, Switzerland and France, those states who, who don't recognize uh, minorities, or whether we have to recognize national and ethnic minorities or providing the, uh, them with uh, the cultural autonomies, etc. Yeah. And my second question is, uh, concerns the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And um, more specifically, the statement of uh, certain countries who didn't adopt this document about the threatness of this document of uh, country integrity, if yeah. it's clear, more or less. Thank you. Uh, will I answer? Yeah. Uh, uh, very good questions, and I'm, I'm sure the other questions that you haven't quite formulated are of the same standard as well. Um, it's, a, it's a good question in terms of how do you do you recognize minorities, or do you simply assume that if you create a strong and inclusive national identity, the minority issue will disappear? And the answer has to be, it depends. It really has to be, because there's no one size that fits all here. So countries like France, Switzerland, Malaysia actually, uh, sorry, Singapore as well, they basically say, you know, we don't really need to recognize minorities per se, because we have robust systems that guarantee rights to all. Now, try telling that to French Algerians who live on the outskirts of Paris. You know, they can play football for France, sure. Can they be, can they be politicians? Can they be brain surgeons? Do they have the same access? So it does, I think the question needs to be answered based on the context you're looking at. If you see that there is a genuine meritoc meritocracy and that that meritoc meritocracy recognizes the need for a socially inclusive society, then you probably need minority rights less. But the fact is, even in Singapore, which claims to be a meritocracy, 93% of resources are owned by the majority. So you wonder about how that is possible. Yes, in an ideal world, we shouldn't get into tribalism. We shouldn't be stressing how different we are from each other, because we're actually not that different. But in a practical world, the differences that exist have existed over centuries. Unraveling them at a stroke of a pen in a legislation is not really going to be very effective. So I think you need to study. So I would say to you, the answer to your question is you start by looking at the society concerned. Look at demographic data. Look at life expectancy. Look at educational attainment. If you can see the bottom 10, bottom 15% all tend to come from one group, you probably need minority rights. Because what you need are some kind of mechanism that will allow that group to go from level zero where they are to level one where the rest of the population is. If, on the other hand, your statistics don't show that, and that actually the bottom 15% is, is multi-ethnic or multi-religious and represents the state, then you probably won't gain much by designing minority rights mechanisms but because what you will do is sow the seeds of dissent um, in a population that's otherwise not, uh, not so keen on recognizing difference. So that's with your first question. With UN DRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I tell my students it's, uh, it's UN DRIP and not even DROP. If it was UN DROP, it might have been worth <laughs> listening to. Uh, I mean, the UN DRIP was essentially framed after 10 years of discussion. And that was meant to be the decade of indigenous peoples, except it was a bit of a secret, so nobody knew, which defeated the object of the purpose all, uh, straight away. Um, the extent to which UN DRIP can create anything is going to be a questionable. First of all, much energy has gone into the formulation of that particular document at the cost of activism at home. And this is the, this is the classic when I said earlier that I'm, I'm skeptical towards the extent to which international human rights law can provide remedies. That's the example I have in mind. Because that particular document sucked in all the indigenous talent for a good 10 years into something that is in the end a drip. Well, as these activists in their domestic systems were making material changes at home. And that for me is the issue. So the, it, it's, it remains to be seen. It's too early to say how effective the declaration is going to be. It's there now as a standard. Uh, for it to really get life, it's up to activists to, to give it that life, to breathe life into it. So the UN, the UN drip might still be something of a significant moment, but at the moment it's too soon to tell. Um, so the Millennium Development Goals have um, presented the most effective, albeit flawed, um, and incomplete uh, framework for addressing global poverty. 
Um, and at the moment, the General Assembly is, is starting off a debate on the post-2015 uh, framework. And within that context, and from your minority rights perspective, do you think legal empowerment, um, human rights, the rule of law, um, justice, mm -hmm. should be included now within this uh, new framework yeah. to be established from 2015? It seems from what you said in your comments that, that you do. Um, at the same time, um, Open Society Justice Initiative have also produced a very significant report mm -hmm. um, endorsing legal empowerment, and I was just wondering about your thoughts on that yeah. too. Thanks, Tejal. The first part of the question, I'm, I'm in a privileged position to answer because I'm on the, I, I chaired the, the, the thematic group on social inclusion. Uh, the debate has been very interesting because essentially I've been privy to the, the setting of the SDGs as they have been called, the Sustainable Development Goals. Essentially a room of about 50 people, about 40 of whom believed that the real challenge was climate change and they would tolerate everybody else in the room. So there was a whole bunch of people who said, the only thing we need to get in our goals is issues on climate change. We don't need this human rights, we don't need any of this other stuff. The difficulty was, of course, the MDGs got a lot of critique for not having human rights in them. So getting a human rights goal, which we're likely to have now, we're likely to have a human rights goal, it's not very well framed because it's been framed as a compromise. And the argument that we are pushing for that particular goal is to emphasize administrative systems, to, admis uh, to, to emphasize good practice, to derive the good practice from all across the world. So the report that you have there, which fed into the Secretary General's report, and the Secretary General's report uses the language from that, from, that, from that report that we submitted, essentially is arguing that not to have naming and shaming as the husting for human rights, but to focus much more on administrative mechanisms. And the reason for that really is that administrative mechanisms are likely to be more accessible to minorities. So we've gone beyond using the, minor, the human rights terminology to really focusing on vulnerability, which of course development economists are more happy with anyway, because vulnerability is a concept they can understand. So not only did Sachs focus on that, but also uh, Al the Al method when they looked at poverty, the, uh, the Oxford Human Development Index, focus much more on household level data. And it, that's all pointing to the fact that there is really a problem here. If you don't set human rights, gender inclusion, minority rights, vulnerable, vulnerability as a marquee in your goals, the problem will be that with climate change and all the other challenges you face, these communities are going to get even further asunder. Because the MDGs did nothing in terms of uh, minority rights, or very little. Gay McDougall wrote something about this if, you, if, you, if you're interested in what, what the MDGs did for for minorities. So the idea is to move towards administrative mechanisms, to move towards measurability of rights violation, and not to use the old-fashioned, you know, rhetorical, legal arguments that antagonize states. Because in that sense, where the, the, the UN SDGs will probably sit, and it's still too early to tell because there's lots of bargaining going on, but where they will probably sit is much closer towards technical cooperation than traditional naming and shaming. Because traditional naming and shaming is going to antagonize the very countries who want, to, who want sustainable development. So that's the issue. On your question on legal empowerment, I mean, in many ways I argue that legal empowerment is less important because of the kinds of societies I work within. Where legal empowerment is so far away as to, be, uh, as to promise the moon to a man in Sudan. So it depends, I think, on where you work with. You certainly have, there's certainly a great deal of Roma activism that takes place through the courts. And in this particular context, legal activism is great. I work in my institution, we have housed the ERAC, the European Human Rights Advocacy Center. They've won 98 cases against Russia and Georgia, mainly on Chechen issues and minority issues. So legal empowerment is something that clearly is a tool. The problem is holding out for that one particular tool at the cost of everything else is not something that societies, especially in the developing world, can really afford. Good evening. Yeah, it's working. Good evening. Um, I have a question related to the, some cultural practices of the minority groups. Um, and I will say an example, for instance, about early marriages or child marriages, which are practices by some minority groups and which are defended by minority groups as being their traditions. So in such situation, what, what is the role of the state? Should the state intervene in order to stop this uh, practice, which seems to be like against human rights, which are international standards, or should the state protect minorities as they are and not to intervene to stop such practice because they are part of 
traditional traditions of the minority groups. So, and at the end of the day, minority rights are only collective rights or also individual rights? Okay, two very good questions. And again, um, reasonable people can disagree on the answer, certainly to the first one. Uh, my perspective on this is that when you look at a specific cultural practice, you have to get to the underlying basis of what is there. So look at something like female genital mutilation, right? I mean, it used to be called female circumcision. Again, a major problem because it doesn't describe what it is. It's mutilation. And you ask, well, is it a, is it a cultural practice? And you say, well, yes, it is probably a cultural practice, but the culture underpinning it is the culture of domination. And the culture of domination, at a very fundamental level, doesn't treat women and men equally. At a very fundamental level, what FGM is, is a justification for male domination and a control of a woman's sexual life. So that issue, cultural or not, in the context of human rights is wrong. So we need to be fierce enough to be able to, to call that when it happens, but we also need to be sensitive enough to find ways for societies to have that discussion internally. So what I would hate to do, and this is the same thing with, sec you know, I personally tend to be secularist. But that doesn't mean that I will impose my secularism on somebody else, because I need to respect the fact that they are religious. So I think it's the same with cultural practices, that what seems to you to be right, first of all, understand, try to understand for yourself what underlies the practice. Then try to explain that and try to engage in a discussion with the minority group as to why it happens and challenge them on these kinds of issues. But in the end, it's for that particular group to realize that actually FGM, for instance, affects 50% of their population and doesn't allow 50% of the population to, to, to function as full human beings in the recognized sense of all the rights. So that's my, that's my answer to your question on cultural practices. On, on the issue of uh, collective versus individual, I mean, in, in many ways, the big question, and this first arose in 1984 in a, a case of the Human Rights Co Committee, it's called the Sandra Lovelace case. Uh, this concerned uh, indigenous Canadian woman the document says Indian. I'm a bit uncomfortable using that because Columbus went the wrong way a long time ago, but we still call them Indian. Um, an indigenous Canadian woman who left the reservation, married a non-indigenous uh, Canadian, then divorced and wanted to come back on the reservation. And the, the, the elder said, sorry, you can't come back. Uh, Sandra Lovelace case, 1984, um, against Canada. That particular issue raised this question of individual versus collective rights. What was more important here? The individual right of the woman or the collective right of the minority to decide who lives in their territory. Now, in the end, the case was decided on gender basis, because actually, if an indigenous Canadian man had gotten divorced, he would, he would be allowed back. So the case was decided there very much on the question of the individual right and not the collective right. But there has got to be room for both. The difficulty with con collective rights is creating a mechanism that's intelligent enough to recognize collective rights while allowing an individual to opt out. I'll give you an example. I live in London. Uh, big Indian community, arranged marriage is a part of the Indian community. You could say, you know, surely a cultural practice is to allow that Indian community to conduct their arranged marriages. And you say, well, you know, okay, if you want to do that by consent, that's fine. But what happens to the individual woman who wants to opt out? Does she have the mechanism to opt out? So you can develop collective rights in these kinds of circumstances, but where there's a conflict between the individual and the collective right, you need to have a quite smart mechanism, to use technolo technological terms, you need to have a quite smart mechanism that allows that individual voice to opt out. Otherwise, what you have is persecution by another majority. Thank you for a great lecture. I just uh, want to ask, how do you see the uh, international human rights uh, uh, aiding the uh, race of migration and especially the south-north or illegal immigration into Europe mm. uh, because we're talking about international law but at the end of the day it's the national states that actually have mm. uh, quite a bit of power to implement it and decide yeah. and uh, as we see recently with all the deaths in the in the sea with the deportations mm. and t treating people like you're not part of our collectivity, therefore yeah. you, we need to expel you no matter what the circumstances. And even in Canada with the tweaking of the asylum seeker uh, rights and you know, taking away the health yeah. uh, credits, like, I just wonder how you see international law actually being able to um, improve the situation yeah. or protect the rights of those who have no nation state to protect yeah. them. 
I mean, it won't surprise you to, to say that I'm skeptical about the extent to which international law can adequately provide um, remedies in these kinds of circumstances. There are standards, of course. There's, a, there's a, the Refugee Convention from 1951. You have an institution, UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, specifically in place to, with that mandate. There's a bit of a divide, and I won't get too much into that, in the politics of refugee and migration and the human rights ones, which have grown quite separately at times. But underlying it all is the fact that these are individuals, are human beings, and have human rights. And underlying it all is a need to protect it. Uh, in terms of human rights law, there, and in terms of domestic law, there has always been this distinction between citizen and non-citizen. And sometimes it's justified. I mean, if you're passing through, I mean, I'm in Budapest for less than 24 hours, there's no reason why I should be voting in your election and deciding issues around or, or being allowed to necessarily even buy land. But being treated as a human being, well, that's a basic standard. So in many ways, with, with questions around mi uh, migration, asylum seeking, refugees, there's something of a basic minimum that has to be in place and that has to be promoted and that you can't slip beyond or be behind that basic minimum. You know, essentially, human rights is, a, is a, in many ways a sign of civilization. We have decided that we have come to this particular point and we will not slip beyond this point. We've abandoned old theories around racial superiority to accept the fact that there was no basis in them. So we have already accepted the fact that every individual is equal. The difficulty really is in providing the very, very basic minimal rights that will give that equality some teeth. The, the only issue I would also, just in terms of your question, is you, you, you framed it as Europe and Canada, but the vast majority of the movements are taking place in the south, from south to south. Jordan, 50% Palestinian, now has 600,000 600, Syrians. Many of these states are frontline states in terms of, not just immigration, but in terms of asylum and refugees, and they are struggling because they don't have the finances that, that Canada might or the, that the European Union might. Uh, in terms of what, what's happening in Europe, of course, you have the European Union, which is uh, creating mechanisms to avoid taking refugees and asylum seekers, which is ironic because when Europeans were fleeing, the rest of the world took them in. It's really ironic that now borders are going up when it's somebody else suffering. Good evening. Uh, my question is less related to minorities and more into uh, international law, and I'm, I apologize for this in advance. <laughs> and um, I would like to ask you, how do you perceive change uh, in the matters of decolonizing de law and international law? For example, uh, for me, it's a great concern that if we try to decolonize law, international law, um, that has been the doctrine of respect to the borders um, in the name of security, uh, will there be a rise in uh, regional security, I mean, in insecurity in terms of, uh, for example, minorities or other ethnic groups that are trying to achieve their own country with armed struggle? Yeah, Thank you. I mean, this is a, a question that I suspect is going to get ever more relevant as we go forward. If you look at um, decolonization and the process of state formation, from the, 19, from 19, from the UN era, from 1945 onwards, you will see that a vast number of states have come into being. But the difficulty is those states have been, while they have been through processes of decolonization, what's often happened is proxy rule. So there's been particular groups that have gained the keys to the kingdom. And if you're a political scientist, read Robert Jackson talks about this very controversially, quasi-states he calls them in Africa. I don't subscribe to that view. But what you do have are stored up problems with regards to ethnic identity. Whether that's in Chechnya, in Kashmir, in Aceh, in, in Kurdistan, all of these are stored up problems with regards to nationalism. And decolonizing in many ways is, go, is it's through that process that you're going to have emerging. You're already seeing quite a lot of it in, in CIS, former CIS countries with Nagorno-Karabakh and all of these other disputes. That for me is going to grow. But in, in many ways, the key is going to be the extent to which we as an international community accept that these are valid questions, but they're valid questions that have to be dealt with through forceful arguments and not the argument of force, right? So you need to be able to reduce the tension on this, first of all, and get bargaining going. But we need to accept the fact that these are genuine, many of these are genuine movements. And it's for the, for the genuine movement to talk to the government and get that process going. That's the only way it could possibly work. The difficulty is that immediately a conflict like this arises and all the powers that be think about their national interest. 
and they start imposing their national interest. And the really, the really big issue, especially now with, with Syria and in the Middle Eastern context, the really big issue is these states are artificial to start with because of sykes Picot and a whole kinds of colonial, all kinds of colonial line drawing. Now that there's a discussion going on, instead of listening, we are again imposing. And that's dangerous. Because if you impose it, you might buy another 20 years. But if you keep him, you, that, that's not going to really succeed. We don't have the effective power to even maintain that. So the discussions have to be allowed to come to the fore. And those discussions have to be conducted in a free and fair way. And we have to deal with the consequences of what the decision will be. Otherwise, we are going to run the risk of the classic, the, the classic 5,200 arguments. 5,000 ethnic groups, 200 states. What happens? Are we going to allow the 200 states to break into 5,000 pieces? And will that be better? And what happens then? Uh, Ethiopia and er Eritrea is a great example. Eritrea breaks away from Ethiopia with justification, but then there's tensions now in, er in Eritrea. So what happens now between the highlanders and the lowlanders? So where will these tensions end? And the only panacea to what one that exists is dialogue and making sure that parties recognize the value of dialogue and feel the need to have that dialogue. Anything else is going to be another imposed solution, and it might buy you 20 years more of peace, if you can call that peace. Uh, it's not a, a question, but I would like to uh, make clear about the land list of uh, about Ethiopia, you told. Uh, yes. Uh, you just I want to, uh, to make clear Ethiopia, uh, the northern part of the Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a highland, uh, rocky and mountainous area. Uh -huh. In this area, Christians are living there and settled. Uh, it's not favorable for agriculture. Uh -huh. uh, this is border to Eritrea and half yeah. of uh, Djibouti. And other part of the Ethiopian uh, area, Somalia, uh, yeah. this is also uh, living there, nomadic people. They don't have permanent uh, okay. area. They move every six months following the monsoon uh, rain. Yeah. And border to the Kenya and Sudan, this is the fertile area hmm. where uh, agriculture people, yeah, forever for agriculture. But in this area, people are living in a big family, scattered each other, mm -hmm. just 150 kilometers for, uh, scattered to each other. Mm -hmm. In the communist area, you know, the government uh, forced the people from northern part of the area mm -hmm. to resettle in, the, in this area. Yeah. And without any preparation, there was no school, electricity, mm -hmm. uh, health uh, facility, and many people was uh, forced to go there, there, and some of the people fled <laughs> from that area back to their uh, land. Uh, another problem, you know, the people living there are most of them Muslims and animists. Hmm. And the people coming from north, they are uh, historically Christians. Yeah. All these uh, the factors, it failed. Yeah. Now, the nomadic people, the government, even the, in the king, even the communist system, it was difficult to uh, treat this problem because these people are all already, they build schools and they left there and they yeah. go to another people. You know, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. And now the government tried to uh, be, bring together these people, the south part of the Ethiopian, uh, just this free land without any uh, use of for agriculture. And the government tried to scatter families to bring together, yeah. build schools, building schools, health centers. This is difficult to, to the government. And the vast land to give to uh, uh, farmers, like Indian companies, most of the yeah. owners are in Indian companies and Chinese. And the people have the, the, uh, the right to work in those companies. There is uh, companies. Uh, the producing, producing uh, maize, wheat, cotton, yeah. uh, and the potato. I think you, de yeah, you that demonstrate. Is a, that yeah, is, that yeah. is. But in the outside, you know, just all the negatives are rising. Mm -hmm. But the people's 
life has changed. Even they didn't attend class. Now, many universities have built there, and the second uh, generation has now graduated there. Yeah. Now they have their admissions. They are now the current prime minister is emerged from that. Yeah. Now the the current uh, prime minister is from that community. Yeah. So if you see deeply, things are totally uh, other. Inevitably, I think one of the things one of the things you do see, and Ethiopia is, a, is an interesting country, of course, because it was the only one in Africa not to be colonized. So, and you still see these tensions there. So, imagine how much more that occurs in societies where the boundaries are artificial. I think those are the kinds of issues that affect quite a lot of the Horn of Africa as well. Thank you. I don't think. Thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you very much for brilliant. Uh, brilliant uh, uh, presentation. We were privileged to have you here, and I'm very happy that there were uh, uh, sufficient, uh, there was a sufficient number of audience to uh, take advantage of this privilege to have you here, and uh, thank you very much, Joshua. And now everyone is invited for a small reception outside. Thank you. <laughs>